Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Joy Laverty. Joy is a trusted advisor in aging, caregiving, and elder care related issues. She is the author of The Complete Elder Care Planner and the new book, Who Will Take Care of Me When I Am Old? Thanks for joining me, Joy. It's a delight, Jennifer. Thank you so much. So we connected because I think you were talking about elder orphans, so people who don't have an immediate family relationship like a spouse or children. And it was that the impetus for writing this book? No, actually, it wasn't. Um, Yeah, elder orphans is a term that people are throwing around. I don't ever use that. I've been seeing it a lot in the news um, because it has a negative connotation. So actually, the the terms that I use are solo agers. Uh, I like that better. Yeah, yeah. Just because there's a lot of respect that we have for, for ourselves when we choose to age solo. Anyway, no, it wasn't the reason why I wrote this book. The reason I wrote this book is because about 10 years ago, people started to come up to me after I would give one of my talks about family caregiving. And they would say, hey, Joy, I really love my caregiving role. I'm taking care of parents and grandparents. But who's going to take care of me when I'm old? And bingo, I knew right away that was what I was going to write my next book about. And sure enough, um, well, 10 years was kind of too soon. So I waited. The timing was better now. Makes sense. And I personally feel like we, we need to think about this in terms of not just, and I believe this is somewhat of a generational thing, is we, we can't, should not just rely on a spouse, family, children, just because we don't know if that, you know, I I expect I will probably outlive my husband, but you never know. There's days I know he'd like choke me to death. (laughs) Um, And our daughter, we only have one daughter. So, you know, that's a huge burden to be like, oh, well, her and her, you know, almost husband will take care of us. He's got aging parents and they're significantly older than my husband and I because he's the youngest of five. But, you know, I just, I feel like, this is a question we all need to ask and maybe have multiple answers to. Absolutely. Um, the children, I'm in the same boat. I have a, I'm a, a mother of one. I see what her lifestyle is right now, and she is juggling a lot. And so she, uh, just, just an amazing amount of responsibilities for these younger people. And to add us to their plate, would not be the responsible thing to do. So I, I am absolutely on board with what you just said. We must have a plan B. And in fact, I like to start with plan B. And then if plan A works, that's great, you know. But plan B could be just about anything that you can imagine. Thinking about it in terms of options is is beneficial because we might come up with an option that's better. Like my daughter has Crohn's disease, which is exasperated with stress. So if she ended up in the role of care caregiving for myself or her dad or, you know, any of her soon to be in-laws, I'm not sure that would be healthy for her. And so that doesn't leave me with too many options. <laughs> yeah. And I like that you 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 are pointing out exactly what might be on her, her agenda. And then that's why we talk to each other now and say, it would be great if it all works out that we are. But here's what I'm going to be thinking about so that you don't have to stress out now. And that's, that's our responsibility. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, is we are never not being the parent, even when we're talking about elder care. And we're still taking care of our children. That is true. This seems to be a lifelong commitment (laughs) that I think it's also generational because my paternal grandmother who passed away in, so what is this year? 2021 at just over 103 had plenty of money to 
seek out options. But she, in turn, expected family to do for family. And unfortunately, and, and I know some people might, might take this statement offensively, my uncle and his wife lived close by. So my aunt did 90% of the caregiving. And my grandmother was mostly blind from glaucoma. So she, her mind was fine. But, you know, you can't see to cook and clean and drive and all the, you know, daily tasks of, you know, just sustaining yourself. Their daughters and granddaughters are in Idaho. And I assumed that when my grandmother was gone, it would be hours before they were hightailing it to the real estate office to sell their house to move to Idaho. And unfortunately, my uncle is not healthy enough to do that. And that mm. frustrates the daylights out of me. I mean, I'm assuming in some respects that if he had wanted to move, I think he would have been like, Mom, you got two choices, you know, <laughs> and they would have and he would have put his foot down. So I, I don't think that she abused that relationship 100 percent. I think he allowed it. But, you know, my aunt took care of her for 25 years and, the, and now they can't go be with their their daughters and granddaughters. That just it makes me want to bang my head on the wall. But I don't because that's not good for your brain. <laughs> yeah. So I hope, that, you know, like my aunt and uncle being. Baby boomers. No, are they baby boomers? Mm, I'd have to think about that one. My parents weren't. So, and my uncle's eight years younger. So I'm going to have to think. I think he is. Anyway, I think as each generation ages, we're starting to realize that we can't just expect family to do for family. One, because, well, their kids are, you know, multiple states away. The granddaughters are still young and multiple states away. So how should we... You've got some, your book is, is, a, it's a kind of a workbook and, a, you know, it's a guidebook, I think is the best term for it. So how should we start thinking about how we want to handle our, our aging years? If that's the right term. It's early for me this morning. <laughs> yeah. So, so people, it's a thick book, right? There's a lot of stuff in it. So, so people often get overwhelmed with that question, where in the heck do I start? And if they don't hear it from me, then they go on and they, they do the best they can. So here's the deal. It's quite simple. There's three top things that people need to think about. And if they just do these top three things, they will be well on their way. Number one, money. How are we gonna finance a longer life? Okay, get your money card in order. Number two, where am I going to live? Now, that is not a that's a question that is not uh, going to have an answer until the day we have our we breathe our last breath. So the housing options are today I can do I can live independently tomorrow. That might not be the case. And then I might not be surrounded by people that I know. So how will my housing provide care? OK, so number two, care. Number three, get your paperwork in order. Legalize everything you want, put it in writing, and make sure you have power of attorney for this, that, and the other thing. That's it. Start there. Money, housing, legal documents. Put it in writing. Okay, so I'm good there. We <laughs> had we had a um, get to know you call, I don't know, feels like forever ago, and I was telling you about our decision to move to we're, we're actually moving we well by the time this comes out we will have moved to a county i have lived in the same county my entire life so moving to a totally different county 2 hours away could be an overwhelming like panic inducing but fortunately i know where the target the michaels and the safeway are so i'm okay <laughs> priorities right but yeah. we were taught so we how we moved right at the beginning of 2020 because we were right sizing our housing options in terms of our money. And then the pandemic happened and the real estate market went berserk. And our best friend said, Hey, we think we're going to move to the Sierra foothills. And we were like, wait, that's not how we want to exit the pandemic. And the kids wouldn't move with us because they have jobs down here. So that's kind of an important thing. 
And then we decided, oh, well, our daughter, bless her heart, so proud of her sometimes, and I'm so impressed that I managed to do raise a good human. She said, you know what? You guys need to do what makes you happy. And if that's two hours away, that's fine. I'm like, okay, well, I don't, you live three blocks down the street and I don't see you every week. So that's probably true. So we opted for a community. It's not an age restricted community that has tons of activities. And we went there because obviously after the pandemic, we need to restart a social life, especially for me because I work from home. My social life has a lot to do with the internet. It'd be nice to have one that's actually in person again. And you pointed out that we were actually going to be building a community of people who might be able to help us. Not sure I want to rely on neighbors for caregiving, but they could be an interim step between being fully independent and needing care. So I thought that was, you know, I'm like, I was really proud of us that we picked this, we made this decision. And it's, I think we're, we're, I think we're setting ourselves up pretty good for our, our later years. But I also have trained my husband. He told the, the broker that helped us buy the house that this was our last house unless we needed assisted living. Basically, it was our last house unless we needed assisted living. And I was like, yay, I've convinced one person <laughs> that that's the right choice. Well, see, basically what you're saying is we make decisions, but they're not our final decisions. Even, even our legal paperwork, we're, we're never done. We're constantly having to assess what decision did I make? Is it working now? Will it work a year from now? Is it working five years from now? Just, just know that people, people make the mistake of thinking, okay, I'm done. I'm done. This is it. We're okay. Shoo. I'm going to go play golf. <laughs> right? No, it's an ongoing assessment. And also it helps to have other people look in on us from every once in a while and let us know if we're, if we're becoming more forgetful. That's the other thing that we may not realize. There's so much we can realize for ourselves. And then we have to surround ourselves by people we trust. And that these people would say to us, you know, Joy, you're, uh, you're repeating eating yourself or you got lost a lot or or I notice you're not eating we need to talk about that just just having um when you said you're you might not rely on your neighbors for caregiving what you can rely on them for if you trust them is for us to just kind of look out for each other and let us know that something might might need to change change is inevitable and we we, we just need to be prepared to change. That's all. Just, just be willing to make adjustments in order to have the quality of life we deserve. Yeah, I never understood the absolute adamant, I'm going to mm -hmm. live in my house till I die. That was my, mm -hmm. my grandmother's attitude. Uh, spoiler alert, didn't happen. She spent the last 10 months of her life in a board and care home. And my, my mom, the, she always said, I don't want to be a burden to you girls. I want to live in my house. Like, lady, those are mutually exclusive at this point. Because after my dad died, she, you know, she needed somebody there 24-7. And that's a very expensive option. And it just, it became obvious to me that the best choice was a memory care residence. And one of the things that most people don't, understand can happen is my mom had friends in memory care she had friends that would tolerate listening to the same story 500 times <laughs> whereas i couldn't tolerate it twice and you know they just she had a good time with some of these ladies it's just it was once i realized that she was a team of three dianes it mm -hmm. it made it easier and then i would do things i would take my mom and one of the other my mom's name was diane and she befriended two other dianes as if that's not confusing enough for us people who don't have a cognitive problem, it was super confusing dealing with them, <laughs> but fun. But I would, I took my mom and one Diane to the nail salon. I took one of them. We'd go to the regional park and walk around and people thought I was crazy, but it's like, it's e almost easier to deal with the two of them than it is one-on-one -on -one with my mom. Mm -hmm. So memory care is not, it's not a horrible option. And mm. the assisted living community that her 
memory care was attached to. They had the best food, you know, and activities and all kinds of stuff going on. So, you know, it's it's not the way it used to be. And I hoping that there are going to be more options going forward for my generation. So. Well, I'm hearing that there are, there are people who are beginning to put villages together and all kinds of neat options. I talk about the, all different kinds of creative ways to um, to be uh, where we live in the book, because a lot of it has to do with, well, what can we make up? And then we'll yeah. do it. It's well, really it? fun. Yeah. it's That's one of the exciting things about our move was is, was, I'm trying to talk in the future and we haven't moved yet, <laughs> is it's like, I love our hometown here, but when you stop and look around, this is a commuter town, you know, what used to be a farming community. Now it's a commuter town. My husband and I both work in town. There's not a lot of options for whatever we want to call ourselves. We're not retired, not semi-retired, but we have a lot of flexibility in our schedules, but there's just not you know, it's very segmented. You can go golf with these people or you could do this with this, you know, and it's like, I like to do crafts and I have no idea how I would find a group that does that other than meet up or I don't do Facebook because I don't like Facebook. But, you know, this community is all, it used to be a vacation rental home community. There's almost 1600 homes. There's a golf course. There's the lake and the the I forget what the name of the big building is, not not the community center, but that's a good enough term. And they have all kinds of groups. And you were talking about relying on your neighbors to look out for you. We already have one neighbor watching the house because she knows it's empty. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. you know, and one gal provided a photograph of the woman who sold us the house, who is a hundred. So it's like, we're already getting to be part of the community and we're not even up there yet. So I'm, I'm excited. Isn't that fabulous? Yeah. I'm hoping so. I keep, we keep thinking, you know, like this seems too good, too good to be true. Where, where's the negative part, but so far it still seems too good to be true, but we'll see. But it's having to learn, you know, have entirely new habits, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I like to shop at Target and Michael's, but I'm going to be going to a new one. It'll be a different, different way to get there and everything will be different. And it's, you could look at it and be like, Oh my God, that's totally scary. But it's, I know it's good for our brains because we're not stuck in a rut. Exactly. Yeah. So how, yeah. how should people start thinking about answer? Or how should they go about answering some of these questions? Okay. We, the money part, that's, uh, that's not your, your bandwidth mostly. That's that, that's what a financial planner is for, but you talk exactly about, right meeting your future self and time travel. You want to explain yeah, that one? Sure. This is, um, this is really a, a wonderful way to get to know what the future might look like. Um, many times we make up stories about old people. We think they're all walking with a cane very slowly, sitting in front of the TV, watching Wheel of Fortune. And we have these pictures and we, we see that um, we make up that this is how it's going to be for us. We also make up that, that it's a given that we get sick when we get older. None of that is true. The, the way that I like to perceive what the future might be is to take a deep breath and go outside and start observing people who are at least 30 years older than, than myself. Where are they going? What are they doing? Who are they hanging out with? What are they talking to each other about? I, bef I talk about tra time travel as is befriending the people who are in my future. I call them my living answers. And I start asking them questions. What would you do differently if you were me? And, and um, what were some of the things that you did that you, that you would change? And can you give me any advice? So it just starts with a fundamental observation so that the future doesn't scare us. And the more we look, the more we see that people are not old and frail. They are, they are doing quite well. And all those myths that we think about slowly but surely go down the, go down the drain. So one thing to do is to 
trying to take a look at what that future could look like. Now, you will see people who are the vision of what we've all known, but you'll see a lot who are not. And that's just one, one really fun thing to do. I will often ask people, how many of you have old friends, meaning 20, 30 years older than you? Many people don't. And it's a good place to start. I, I have so many old friends and I keep making new ones. And um, I, I couldn't do life without them. I have a friend who's in our cycle group who is 31 years older than me. And I harass him all the time <laughs> because when we are riding our bicycles together, okay, he's been riding a lot longer than I have. I think he's been riding most of his life. So he's got that on me. But he's 31 years older than me and he's faster uphill and he's faster yeah. on the flats. And I'm like, dude, can't I get an age advantage or something? Here? <laughs> and he just calls you the kid, right? <laughs> he, he just laughs. And when he's on the yeah. bike, you would never know that he's significant. I mean, that's a lot. That's more than half my life older than me. And he unfortunately was in a bicycle accident recently and broke his mm -hmm. femur. Now, people who are in their 80s when they break a ba major bone, it's not usually a good outcome, but he's he he's tolerating it pretty well. He had to have, a, I guess, a pin or, you know, as, unfortunately, as we age, you know, bones need to be put back together with hardware, which is not fun. But, you know, he my mom broke her leg and died within three weeks and she's young, well, was younger than him. So and when I found out that he'd crashed in a group ride and broke a big bone. It was like, oh no, but he's doing really well. So it's, it's good to be able to see people like him and tease them about not giving you an age advantage, but That's it's right. also <clears throat> beneficial to, to realize that it is possible to be in your early eighties and break a major bone and not go down the drain. Because That's if right. we keep, if we think about, oh, well, you know, when I'm in my eighties, I'm not gonna be able to ride my bike or I'm not, of course, that's all going to come true because you're programming your brain that way. That's right. My, right now, my husband is in Scottsdale, Arizona with a bunch of other guys, and they're all playing men's senior baseball. Oh, so fine. they have the old, older 50 league, 60 league. My husband's in the over 70 league. And this week, the over 75 group is pay, playing men's senior baseball. We're not talking softball. We're talking real hardball. And wow. it's, it's, a, it's a joy to watch these guys. If you were looking at it from a distance, you wouldn't be able to tell that these are a bunch of, bunch of 80 year olds, 70 and 80 year olds playing baseball. So it's, so what I've learned is it's exposing ourselves to old people and learning about, you know, how, how did you get to be so healthy? What did you do right? Now, some of them will say, I smoke cigars and I drink you know, whiskey or whatever, but a lot of them will just tell you what they do. And, and um, they're incredible, but we have to, we have to observe, we have to ask questions. And that's, that's the way you get to, uh, you can say, well, okay, so if this person can do this, I got to make some different plans here and, um, and see what I could do. I like to ask them a lot about their friends. I like to ask them about where they live and how they, how they get around. Um, the things that would apply to me when I get older. So, so I, I like practical questions and answers. That makes sense because, you know, I've always said if humans learned from the previous generation, we would be just like superheroes okay. or, you know, we'd be almost immortal at this point. And we don't do that very well. So that's, you're basically suggesting that, you know, learn from the people who are doing it. If you want to yeah. live well in your 80s and 90s, and talk to people who are living well in their 80s and 90s. That's time travel. <laughs> so now that we've befriended older adults who are living the way we want to live, then what's our next couple of steps? Well, there's another thing that I that I'll, we were never taught this when we were kids, but um, it's called critical thinking. Yeah, so, that's for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't even know what it was until I decided it was important to talk about it in the book. So when we are making plans, instead of just talking to one person and an advisor, and they're all great, you know, you have your lawyers and your insurance people and your money people, but I would go outside the box 
And I would say, all right, you know, use the, the professionals in our lives as a foundation. And then I would expand my circle by culture, by, by gender, by age. And I would ask a lot of questions. And this is what critical thinking looks like so that I could get different perspectives and then put my plan together. One of the funnest people that I ask questions to when I'm in the process of doing critical thinking is my eight-year-old granddaughter. And I say, all right, here's what I'm thinking about. And I got to make some decisions. What would you do? And then I lay it all out and you should see the wheels turn in her head. <laughs> and she comes up with the most creative things. And then I just said, you know, that is awesome. And she tells me who I should go talk to and what I, what I should ask them. And uh, I wouldn't go anywhere without this kid. <laughs> She's <laughs> fabulous. Oh, you might have to loan her out. <laughs> Sounds... I know. I know. I say, if you don't have grandchildren, rent one. Yeah, your, really. friends have, your friends have grandchildren. In, and if you're close to your friends, get, get close to their children and their, and their grandchildren. That's another thing I talk about is, is there's another ex, uh, extended network of support. Our friends' children tend to like us. You know, we've we've we know each other and then we get to know their children. So mm -hmm. stay close to them, too, because that's a nice network that we have created. So friends, kids and grandkids, stay well, close to these people. My husband's been there for our best friends, kids, because I swear yeah. every time they'd go out of town for business. I mean, one, let's see, he had to rescue their oldest son once who slipped working and they thought he broke his elbow. Thankfully, he did not. Then another time they left town, their daughter got into a car accident. My husband had to go rescue her. <laughs> so he's like their, uh, I forgot what she called him, but like her alternate dad or something mm -hmm. to that effect. And when he heard her say that, and this is in the midst of, you know, beefing about wedding plans, <laughs> she, he was just so touched. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. And I, I get along so great with their oldest son, who is way smarter than I am. He's got a Ph.D. and and just we but we talk like we could talk almost like equals. Then so then he kind of launches into his thing and it's like, well, you lost me. <laughs> come back to come back to my level, please. But, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, I never I guess I don't know. We'll have to see. They're supposed to be moving to the same town we're moving to. They're just taking their sweet time. We. We made a decision and and decided it was right and and we did it. <laughs> so hopefully it's right. <laughs> but yeah, I like that. And the the responses from your granddaughter are any of them like ones that you actually take action on? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just because um just because they're uh typically more about telling someone what to do, which is eight-year-olds love to do that. Now you need to do this and do that and tell her this or that and the other thing. As she gets older, I will continue to ask her, but see what we're really doing is bonding in another way. And so I think right now for, for the both of us, that's what we're establishing. She's res She sees that I respect her opinion. But then again, I don't, I don't necessarily follow someone else's opinion either. So um, as she gets older, I imagine she will come up with some very interesting creative ways to uh, figure out situations. Just the different perspectives help. Yes. I've always tried to get the, the take from both sides. It's a little mm -hmm. more challenging these days, but I, I try very hard when I'm trying to understand you know, like when the Supreme Court was debating whether or not gay marriage should be constitutionally protected, you know, my whole attitude was, yes, I think that should be. But why did these other people not think that? I didn't just lay it out like, well, this is it. This is my opinion. You're not changing it. I, I sought out why other people felt differently, and it didn't change my my thought, but it made me understand their position much better. So it make to me, it makes me um, not more tolerable, but I'm more tolerant of them, which still sounds very negative. I don't like that, but it, I just like the understanding and, you know, sometimes somebody might come up with something and you're like, oh yeah, that's, 
I like that perspective. I'm going to have to think on that. And you might shift your beliefs or something, maybe not on Mm -hmm. something quite that fundamental, but it'll be interesting in our new community to now that, you know, like I said, it's not age restricted. So it's got multi-generational, little generationals. Oh my gosh. Multi-generations. So it'll be interesting to see if we befriend people whose kids or grandkids we also befriend. That'll be, that'll be kind of fun. And you, <laughs> More yeah, things to look for. Yeah, you'll expand this circle and uh, I'm sure it'll happen. I'm sure it will too, because I think based on just from what we've learned of the community thus far, I think we might actually have to hide in the house if we don't want to be part of social events. <laughs> Lean against the door going, no, 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 we can't do any more fun stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I'm tired. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly it. It's just, I had this, I had this funny dream that my husband and I raced in the house and slammed and leaned against the door and people were banging on it. You have to come to baseball. You've got to come. (laughs) It's like, that was the strangest dream, but we shall see. We'll have to, uh, I will add an addendum to this recording because it will come out after we move to see if these predictions come true which or if it's if it's if it is too good to be true or if it's actually as good as as advertised so far so we've we've taken care of our legal and financial documents and and stuff to you know as far as we can it you know because like like you said it's always changing and now well, we're, here's we're, the here's the thing about those documents um uh to look at them at least every six months. The reason is, is the people we typically uh, name as agents and other people who are gonna take care of things, sometimes they move away, sometimes they're close in age to us. And then if that's the case, we have to see if forgetfulness is setting in on their end. And so I used to be when we were younger, we didn't have to look at these documents. We'd put them in place and take a look at them every couple of years, right? But now I suggest that we look at our documents every six months because we live in such a mobile society and we've got to make sure that the people that we are naming are still capable of of doing what we are asking them to do. So, um, so many people get caught off guard because they didn't look at the document. They don't even remember who they named and so on. So. I um, I have a little tickler in my to do list that says every six months, just take a a brief look at it. And also I look at who I'm, I am named in my responsibilities. And I check in with the people and say, do you still feel this way about, you know, especially, especially their uh, wishes, the power of attorney for healthcare. I'll say, is this still what you want? And because that's what it says in the document and they say yes or no. Well, that also gives them the opportunity if they were like, Oh, I'd really like to to take off joy and put on so and so. Yeah, or maybe exactly. they've got and but yeah. they feel weird because you've got a yeah. close relationship and they're like, Well, I don't want to offend her. So you ask if if they've even thought about making a change, it makes it much easier for them to say, you know, I think my I might put my new son in law in charge of mm-hmm. that for now, whatever. So that that is a really good idea. And since we're supposed to check smoke alarm batteries when we <laughs> spring forward and fall back. <laughs> There you go. We're supposed to, this is the Thursday before fall back. So you you could, you know, just add that to the spring forward fall back. Although I just read this morning that 19 states want to make daylight savings time permanent, which requires a federal law change. It's like, whatever. (laughs) It's just this debate over daylight savings is it's fascinating when you realize certain states, if they're on the Eastern edge or the Western edge of the time change, Daylight savings is not necessarily some places it's better and some places where it's like a whole thing. It's like, whatever, you know, just I like the daylight. So whatever, whatever I need to do to keep daylight, that's fine. But I'll just get up when the sun comes up and go to bed when the sun goes down. <laughs> it's pretty easy. But like I said, I don't commute. But add that, add the check batteries, check your CO2 uh, alarms. Check your documents. Is there anything else we need to do with the spring forward fall back? Uh, no, that's enough. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be a whole day of checking in on stuff. That's funny. Yeah. Okay. So we're checking in on those. We've got them all in, in order. We've, we've time traveled and, and met our future selves in our, our older friends. What else should we be doing? What's, what's the, besides be willing to change, 
What else should we be doing? Well, we need to know how to be a friend. We need to check, do a checklist for ourselves, not for the other people. But you started to talk on an edging on, is this too good to be true? Well, it, that is such an important process because ultimately that's pretty much all we've got. We've got the quality of the relationships, but it doesn't happen by accident. There's a reason why that lady wanted to help you. There's a reason why people are gravitating toward you. You must be doing something that is very open so that it's a give and take and a give and take and a give and take. I'm sure that that has everything to do with it. So what else we need to be doing is, is doing a self-analysis and accountability for ourselves. What kind of friend am I being? And will this sustain, will my friendships sustain when I need them? Jennifer, I can't tell you how many times that I hear from other women, especially, why do, I, why do all my friends disappear when I get sick and I ask for help? Well, I, I very solemnly say, what has, what has been the case for you to give? Why are they not giving to you? Are you a taker? Are, if we, the more we take, the, the more we'll be alone. This is a really important thing because what it all comes down to is who's going to be there for me when I need it. And it has to do mostly with our friends. Now, that makes perfectly good sense. And an example of, of being, being there for somebody without being too overwhelming is, again, the best friends who initiated the move and are now following us, which is funny. Mm-hmm. So back in the early days, so the summer of 2020, their oldest son, daughter-in-law, and 10-month-old at the time, granddaughter, all got COVID. So this was before vaccines and all that stuff. And fortunately, they're all fine. No, yeah. it does not appear that there's any, you know, after effects, which we've heard a lot about. And I just sent her via text message, just like a funny GIF almost every morning for about a week and a half. And then a little less frequently as they started getting healthier again. And I, I, the first one I sent, I'm like, just wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you. Thought this was funny and cute. Don't You don't need to reply. I'm just here if you need me. And I think she sent me like a thumbs up or a heart or something. And then mm-hmm. I just sent her. It's like, oh, let me send another. F- oh, this is funny. Let me send that. I just wanted her to let her know I'm out here. I'm thinking about you. Don't worry about me because you got enough stuff on your plate. So it's not that hard, especially with technology. You know, you could drop off a meal if people need it. You know, there's a lot of ways to be there without being, you know, pulled under the tide kind of thing, which I think a lot of people are, we've got so many things we got to do. It's like, Mm -hmm. my gosh, if I help Joy, you know, it's like a a whole Uh. thing. You know, when (laughs) it doesn't have to be a whole thing unless that's what she needs. Right, right. And you can't do this overnight. It takes time. To establish trust with each other, means it's been tested by time that you we did show up at two in the morning when they called or so, something happened so that so that we we have these relationships but they but they take time and they take effort and but but not not uh, uh, not one that is hard and mental you know emotionally challenging we do it out of love and you can tell when somebody's really ready to be there for you but the important thing is, it's not going to happen overnight. You got to, if you, you know, these people who say, oh, I'm so alone and stuff like that. It's like, oh, okay, well, make a decision today that you are going to be more giving in one way, shape or form with someone or an organization or somehow I list a zillion different ways how to make friends in the book and, and make a decision. You are going to, you are going to be the best friend ever. For, for one other person and watch what happens because people are only alone if they want to be. That is true. 
one of the things I think is the easiest way to start being a good friend is just to listen mm. and to share your gifts. Um, I don't want to, well, sometimes I think when you hear share your gifts, people are like, oh, let me tell you, like, I know all about Alzheimer's and caregiving and blah, 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 blah. No, just, just be there when yeah. somebody has a question and then listen because mm -hmm. nobody listens anymore. <laughs> They, that is so true. And, and it can be frustrating when you're the listener and then you're always the listener. However, uh, it's okay if, if you can get a word in there edgewise and they, you know, you, they, those of us who speak for a living know that there is a way to kind of wake people up to their, to their, talking too much about themselves and just to say, I love what you're saying. Here's how what you're saying matters to me. Here's my experience with what you're talking about. And that there is a, a very gentle way to bring it back so that we can equalize the relationship. It's important to not write them off and, and just say, oh, you know, I can't take one more word out of this. It, so, so if you really love that person, you, would, you, you really want to connect with them, learn how to help them bring it back. And then, and then you, you know, we can't keep writing people off. We'll, we'll end up alone. We, we are better off trying to see if they'll, they'll just take a deep breath. A lot of times people don't even know they're doing it. I, I've discovered that. They just don't know. The more you're quiet, the more they talk. <laughs> That's true. And it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. So, so whose responsibility is it if I don't say, hey, you know, time out. Well, like and I, I have a wonderful girlfriend. She is the best storyteller in the world. She, I live in Chicago and she's trained at uh, Second City. So she does improv like nobody's business. And she could talk about herself for hours because she thinks the world is a stage. And I, I absolutely just adore her. And so she knows when I say, okay, <laughs> she'll go, okay, okay. And then she'll, she'll, she'll come back to the relationship. But it's my responsibility to just kind of even out the deal here. Well, I like the way you put it is to say, oh, I like essentially I hear what you're saying. And here's my experience in a similar vein. Yeah. That way you're not like, oh, it's my turn to talk now. <laughs> right. Because because it also shows we're listening. And we sometimes have to train people that we're with. We have to train them how to be with us. And, and it, it doesn't take much effort after a while, especially if you really love someone and they, it, that you could call them at two in the morning and they'd be there. And so what if they talk a lot? Who cares? Just, just you know, we need each other so much. That is very true. So I know that you have a contractor coming shortly. <laughs> we're, we're lucky they weren't early, but we don't want yeah. to oh, they're swap of early, right? Um, I had somebody show up half an hour early yesterday, which wow. actually was good, but yes. you know, so yeah, <laughs> normally people aren't early. Well, no. I don't know. They're only early when it doesn't benefit you, <laughs> but right. is there any, okay. So we've got our documents in order. We're, we're befriending people of multiple generations and, mm -hmm. and diverse, not just, that's the only negative with our new community is it's not diverse at all, but okay. You know, no, nothing's yeah. perfect. And we're learning how to be a good friend. So how is this? Let's let's put all let's just put the bow on this one. So now we've done all these things. How does this yeah. tie into like who's gonna take care of me when I'm old? That's a great question. I was gonna say silence. <laughs> it will it will not be a straight line. You just define this and this and this and this and this and and watch what happens. So it will don't be surprised if, if you're going in six different directions at any time, as long as you've given thought to to your plans and not be afraid of change. You know, the most successful people that I've learned that my old friends tell me is they spend most of their time in limbo, in the transition of it all. They don't worry about the change. The change happens. They move on. So they go to the transition part and they say, hey, clean slate. 
this happened and now I get to now I get to make up a whole new thing now. And just just know that that this tying of the bow will never happen until we take our last breath. <laughs> that's probably very true. And I it's after this pandemic and everything that's happened yeah. in the last two years in my life and the last five. It's actually very refreshing to be thinking about starting a whole new chapter in like a whole new way. It's not terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I could think about it in those respects, but I'm excited about all the options and being able to kind of rewrite my future history. But mm -hmm. is this a topic that you would suggest younger, like the millennial caregivers might be like starting to think about? Well, <clears throat> it's funny that you should ask that question because when I was doing, um, and we're getting, I'm getting back on the road again because now that's coming. I do a lot of work with corporate America, with the employees, and they're all millennials. And they mm -hmm. can't get enough of planning. They are good planners. They're good listeners. They like to hear their options. And so uh, when I give a talk, there's more typically more, uh, well, 50-50 millennials in the room. Millennials and people my age, boomers. You guys are letting out the Gen Xers again. My poor generation's well, always forgotten. <laughs> yeah, they come in. They come in, and um, they are loved by both. They're kind of like the the ones that that we take along. Both both take along with them, and uh, yeah, yeah. It's because there's more of you guys on both sides. Mm -hmm. We're we're the peanut butter between you guys. <laughs> yeah, I love Gen. My daughter's a Gen X, and it's so neat to. Um, to watch how how she's she's just surrounded by young and old. It's just beautiful. Yep. Well, that's I it, you're giving me some additional motivation and um mm, like places good. to start with our new community. So I good. Well remember I, I, Jennifer when we were talking on the phone and I talked about the book club? Mm-hmm. And that so, so people said, well, how do you make friends? And then you and I got talking about, well, you know, I love to read. And I said, well, start a book club. There's probably already one there, but we'll see. We're just, we're going to, we're going to go and we're going to, we're going to figure You're out. You're going to find that, out. That's yeah, right. I, I'm excited because I make comments like, I used to have great vegetable garden and I don't know if it's climate mm. change or me or both or whatever mother nature just thumbing her nose at me, but I have had more, I have fed more squirrels, tomatoes and had more mm -hmm. issues. And so my husband's like, well, are we going to plant fruit trees and do a vegetable garden in the new house? And so I basically tell him, I don't know, we seem to spend $300 to get one decent tomato. That doesn't seem smart. And then I make the comment, well, if I can find a, a gardener that can help me. And he's like, I'm sure they're around here. And I'm like, I'm sure they are too. So it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. You could, have a gar you could have a gardening club. I, there's probably one there too. So we'll see. Yeah, and well, I know there's a craft club, so I got to find them <laughs> like between Christmas and the, the Christmas Yosemite trip and the New Year's wedding. I'm probably going to like, okay, I'm here. Gonna, you are going to be one busy person. I can I just see you closing the door. I'm, I'm yeah, tired. I, I need to <laughs> it's like, I have to go make a podcast, people. <laughs> right. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's my other plan is to share as much of that, that gift I have to people. Yeah. So we shall see what happens. I appreciate this so much. The book is really wonderful. Let me show it one more time for those of you who are watching the YouTube channel. Who will take care of me when I'm old? Please don't just assume it's going to be your kids because that's not a good plan. And I appreciate this and good luck with your contractor. <laughs> Thank you. I hope he shows up. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.